One of the reasons I love worshiping with our worship team is to watch them worship. And I don't know about you, but I think Matt Cater on bass and Tim on the drums, they appear to really believe what they're playing, don't you think? <laughs> they appear to be worshiping God. Thank you for leading us so well. All right, let's begin uh, this morning with a little hypothetical scenario and then a question. The scenario will be, will be familiar to most of you, I would assume. So this is the situation. You're in a checkout line, Target, Walmart. There's Target people, there's Walmart people. I'm more of a Walmart person, I don't know about you. But either way, you're in checkout line and uh, you put all your items on the belt and the person behind you asks you to hand you one of those little dividing sticks, you know, and so you reach and you turn your hand to the person. And then you look at that person and you have a decision. Do you start a conversation or do you just hand it to them and turn around with your back to them and go about your business? Now, what I want, here's the question. I want you to watch what's about to play on the screens, and I want to you, to, you to imagine each face you see is that person behind you. What do you think? What do you feel? What do you say? Ready? Let's watch this together. I knew you'd laugh. <laughs> All right, one more image. This one, I will warn you, is a bit disturbing. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. If you don't know, that's Pastor Brian Coffey with the stash. <laughs> All kidding aside, what'd you feel? What'd you think? We saw those faces. You, they ask you to hand that to them. You turn it in. That's who you see. What do you do? How do you, what, how do you respond? Start a conversation or turn your back and go about your business? This is, uh, we'll get to why this matters and what we're talking about here. We're in the third week of our series called Street Level Faith, a study of the letter of James. James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote this letter to Christians who were scattered throughout the Roman world. They were being persecuted for their faith. So he writes this letter to them. Uh, kind of in general, Christians spread around. And James's primary concern, as we've seen last week, Pastor Brian talked to us about, without the stash, he talked to us about what it means to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And as we've seen, James is, his, what he's really getting at is not theological detail, not talking about doctrine. He sort of assumes you know and believe this. His big concern is, what difference does it make in your life? What should your life look like if you really believe all this stuff? How should you act? How should you behave at the street level in your faith, in other words? Let me read to you now uh, James 1, 27 through 2, 13. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes, in, comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme and the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. 
So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, I don't have to tell you this. It's pretty obvious from the text. James is very direct. He doesn't talk around subjects. He doesn't dance around the issues. He goes right after it, speaks right to the heart. And he's talking to us here about what we might call the problem of partiality. Now, partiality doesn't sound like a very big deal. Like in English, being partial, your Bible might say favoritism. That's, I mean, okay, maybe it's not a good idea to play favorites, but it's not that big a deal, is it? But James compares it to murder and adultery. It's a big deal, apparently. When he says, what does genuine religion look like? What does real faith, true faith, pure religion look like? Now, this is one of the few places the word religion is used in the New Testament to talk about our faith. Because we often say it's not a religion, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. What he means by that is this. What does it look like if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And he's not, he, what he's saying here is this. It's not the, uh, the external forms, going to church, going through the motions, going through religious rituals. What matters is how you treat people, how you act when you're outside of the religious gathering as well as inside the religious gathering. The problem of partiality. In verse 4 he says, this is a reference to judges who, make, who take bribes. He says, aren't you becoming judges who judge with evil intent? It's a reference to those judges who can't be trusted because they're unjust. They take bribes. In other words, what James is saying is, the way you treat people, a varying, uh, th that differ economically, socially, and gender, racially, the way you treat them is an issue of justice. It's unjust to be partial. It's an issue of discrimination, prejudice, he says. And he says that has no place, absolutely no place in the community of faith, in the community of Christ. And then he gives us kind of three reasons why, why it has no place. And we'll talk about those. First, it steals God's glory. Being partial, prejudiced, discriminatory, playing favorites, robs God of glory. How do, what does he mean there? Look at how he begins verse 1 of chapter 2. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. That phrase, the Lord of glory, why does he use that phrase? James doesn't even name Jesus more than three times in, the, in his letter. This is one of the key times it's important to notice what he says. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. What he's saying is basically this. There's the Lord of glory, and there's everybody else. There's Jesus and the rest of us. We live in a culture and a society that's constantly ranking people. You did it a moment ago, didn't you? You don't want to admit this, but you did. You watched that video, and you did your own little internal profiling. You knew what I was getting at, so you probably tried not to, but you can't help it, right? You, you think about, oh, you, you, you make presumptions about people, and we internally rank them. Now, you might be sophisticated enough or moral enough not to behave that way externally most of the time, but we're doing it internally all the time. That's what James is talking about here. There's Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, and there's everyone else. Isaiah chapter 42 says this, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. In other words, he alone is worthy. We sing about that, right? You alone are worthy of our worship. You alone are worthy of our praise. You alone are to be glorified. Now, I'm not saying, as Christian people, we can't admire or respect other believers or other individuals. Of course we can. But that's a very different thing. Admiration and respect is very different from the internal ranking system in our hearts, from prejudiced partiality that favors one person over another person. That's what he's saying has no place. And when we do that, we actually rob God of the glory he's due, because he alone is to be glorified. And if we're glorifying some other person, we're not giving it to the one it belongs to. This is it's robbing God of glory. He says, as you hold to your faith in the Lord of glory. In other words, to the degree that you see Jesus as the Lord of glory, you will be less and less discriminatory, partial, prejudiced in your heart. What did you think when you saw Chip and Joanna Gaines up there on the screen? You'd think, ooh, that'd be awesome if they're behind me in Target. Target, doesn't Target carry their line of whatever Magnolia stuff, right? I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, it'd be awesome if you saw them there. Would you talk to them? You'd be so excited and nervous, probably you wouldn't. Some of you might faint. <laughs> right. 
We do this in our hearts, right? We rank people. <gasps> Did you notice that was Chris Bryant? My daughter's favorite baseball player. <laughs> I put celebrities in there for a reason. We do this in our hearts. We do this in our lives. We live in a culture full of it, constantly. Let me ask this question. Who are you predisposed to show partiality toward? If you're honest with yourself. Who are your kind of people? Who are you predisposed to be biased against? Who do you view as, well, them, they are the problem in this country? James is saying, listen, if you belong to Jesus, that just has no place in your heart. It just has no place. I'm not saying you can't call out actions and situations that are wrong. He's saying you can't view people that way. It robs God of glory. Second, it violates God's law. It violates God's law. God defines what authentic faith is. James says, honest, true, pure religion is this, how you treat people, in other words. God defines what authentic faith is, not us. David Platt, in his commentary, if you've ever read the book Radical, he's the author, he wrote a book, uh, wrote a commentary on the book of James. And in his commentary, he says this, I am convinced that the deep, dark secret of our religious subculture in America today is that we want Christianity and we want the church on our terms according to our preferences and in alignment with our lifestyles. And I think he's dead on. I like the church. I like my faith. Because they're my kind of people here. They do things the way that I like. It's not very offensive. It's mostly inspiring. It's not terribly boring. Think about what we're saying. Me, what I want, my preferences. Let me read verses 8 and 9 of chapter 2. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. It can't be any more clear than that. It violates God's law. The royal law comes from our, meaning it comes from our true king. We are his subjects. We're under his rule and his reign. We, call, we sing about King Jesus. Do you live that way? As if he's your king? as if he has rightful claim over your life, as if he decides and he defines what true faith looks like, not you. And then James singles out this one command, loving your neighbor as yourself. We talk about being a family of neighborhood churches here. We, we, we talk about the neighborhood vision. We want to love our neighbors as ourselves. One of the central commands. When Jesus was asked in Matthew 22, what's the greatest command in all scripture? Break it down for me, Jesus. Give me the, boil it down. He says it's really two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. These go together, and all the law and the prophets hang on these two things. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what James quotes here. He's actually quoting not just from Jesus, but all the way back to Leviticus chapter 19. Let me read Leviticus 19, verses 15 through 18. In the Old Testament law. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall, you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. God defines what authentic religion is not us that's why he keeps saying i am the lord you shall love your neighbor as yourself james says you want to know what it means to be authentic in your faith how do you treat people how do you view people from the old testament to the new testament this is the heart of god's law now james seemed to antis seems to anticipate i think what an objection we might have which is something like this okay 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 i don't always treat people the same sometimes i'm unfair in my judgments but I'm not an adulterer. I haven't cheated on my wife, and I'm not a murderer. And James says, funny you should bring that up, because in verse 10, what does he say? Right after this, in verse 10, I'll read this for you. It won't be on the screen. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Why does he go right there from favoritism and partiality? Why not like lying or, you know, cheating? But why do adultery and murder? He wants us to understand the seriousness of this in God's view. How we view people, how we treat people, has, says a lot about 
what we really believe about Jesus and ourselves. Finally, it dishonors God's children. It dishonors God's children. James gives a fascinating little scenario, doesn't he? He gives this little hypothetical story about imagine two people walk in to your gathering. That's a reference to the Christian community, the church. Like this morning, two people walk in. One looks sharp. One of you complimented my jacket this morning. Thank you for that. Right? Looking sharp. Somebody else walks in and they don't smell so good. and They don't look so good by our standards. And you treat the person who looks good with honor. And you marginalize the one who, by whatever standard, doesn't looks like maybe they slept on a park bench. James says, what are you doing? There's a story about uh, Mahatma Gandhi who was exploring the teachings of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount and was fascinated by him and went to a gathering, a local church gathering run by uh, the colonial Brit- British um, colonialists in, in India. And this was, I don't remember the denomination, but he went to this church gathering. And he walked in, and they gre- greeted him at the door, and the, some of the men, elders, greeters, said, uh, the gathering for your people is down the street. The Christian gathering for your people is down the street. In other words, a polite way of saying whites only. And Mahatma Gandhi wrote about this and said, if there's a caste system in Christianity, in the church, like there is in Indian society, Hindu society, then might as well stay a Hindu. In other words, what's the difference? If they're ranking people and judging people and marginalizing people the same way that my own culture is doing, why should I change? Why should I be interested? That's what James is saying here. You want to be different in the world? You want to stand out in the world? It isn't by wearing protest signs and marching. It's by stop being partial. Stop being prejudiced. Stop being discriminatory. Start treating all people as your brothers and sisters. That stands out. That looks different in the world. All right, let's talk about the power to actually be impartial. The power to be impartial. Let me, let me ask this question. When we talk about this partiality, discrimination, we're saying that each individual person has dignity and rights and value in the eyes of God. And most of you would say, yeah, yeah, we get that. That's in our Constitution. You know, all, we, we hold these truths to be self-evident, right? That all people are, are endowed with inalienable rights by their creator. We understand that. We think it's common sense. But where did this notion come from? Where did the, the idea that individuals have universal human rights, where did it actually come from? Do you know that it's not always been common? We call it common sense, but it's not always been common in human history. In fact, this development is a very recent thing in human civilizations. Aristotle said, when you closely examine the different groups of humanity, you can clearly see that some are born to be slaves. Aristotle, pretty smart guy. That was just common, that was common sense in his day and for most of human history. Most civilizations and cultures throughout history have not had the view that each individual has dignity and human rights. This has actually not been common sense because the idea is rooted in the biblical ethic, the Judeo-Christian ethic that all people are created in the image of God. I'm going to read to you an excerpt from a sermon that Martin Luther King Jr. gave at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in 1965. He says, you see, the founding fathers were really influenced by the Bible. The whole concept of the Imago Dei, the image of God, is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected. And this gives him, this person, uniqueness. There are no gradations in the image of God. Every man, from a treble white to a base black, is significant on God's keyboard. I love that line. Precisely because every man is made in the image of God. One day we will learn that. We will know one day that God made us to live together as brothers and sisters and to respect the dignity and worth of every man. Martin Luther King Jr., who's, you know, building his whole platform for racial justice and equality on the image of God. Brian Tierney, professor of history at Cornell University, specializes in the development of Western philosophies and political thought. Here's what he writes about this. The idea of natural human rights, which is now dominant in Western societies, developed out of specifically Christian ideas and how those Christian concepts influenced jurists and lawmakers in the early Middle Ages. Prior to this, the idea of universal human rights was not universal at all. Last quote, David Bentley Hart, a brilliant sociologist and historian, writes, We must not forget where our contemporary Western societies' larger notions of the moral good really come from. Compassion, 
pity, equality, charity, as we understand them, have not always been around. We should acknowledge that we are the inheritors of a social conscience whose ethical grammar would have been very different had it not been shaped by Christianity. Here's the issue, though. We're living in a culture and a society that demands and wants universal human rights, but has totally re rejected the soil and the root out of which they grew. We've divorced ourselves from the foundation where those things came from, but we're demanding them. I don't know if that's tenable. How many of you have heard of a guy named Jordan Peterson? Philosophical scholar, in, in, uh, he's Canadian. Uh, he's, he's kind of agnostic, but he talks about how, like Nietzsche, the, 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 the philosophers, recognizing that if we cut off from this foundation, our desire for these principles won't last long. It'll fall apart. And I think we're seeing that today. I think we're seeing that in our culture today. All right, but that's like society as a whole. I spent more time on that than I probably intended to. What about you? What about me? James is not talking about like the philosophy of Western society. He's talking about your life and my life and how we view and treat people. This is what he's really concerned about. To answer this, I want to take you to an encounter of Jesus in Luke chapter 7. And, and in order to, I'm going to set the scene for you first. In order to understand what's going on here, Jesus is invited to a dinner party at a man, a, a Pharisee, a religious leader in the community named Simon, to his house. And Jesus is intentionally insulted and disrespected when Simon invites him. In these ways, he walks in and Simon does not greet him with a kiss, which would have been customary for, for an honored guest in that culture. He does not wash his feet or even have anyone wash his feet, nor does he provide water for washing. That would have been, comp that's, that's not an unintentional miss. That's an intentional slight. He's snubbing him. This is unheard of. And he does not anoint his head with oil. These, all three of these things for an honored guest would have absolutely been done. So Simon invites Jesus over for dinner, but he doesn't really want to honor him. He wants to expose him as a fraud. Get, you get it? And during dinner, a woman comes in. Now, you might think, how'd she get in the house? An open courtyard, most likely, was where wealthy people lived, how they lived in that day. She would have come into that courtyard, as many people in the town would have done, to listen to the pearls of wisdom dropping from these religious scholars' lips as they ate. And she, instead of staying on the, on the outside, approaches Jesus' feet and is moved to tears by the way he's being treated. Starts weeping at his feet, perhaps you've heard of this part, wetting them with her tears and wiping his feet with her hair and pouring out expensive perfume on his feet. Simon sees this and judges Jesus and the woman as, <laughs> see, I knew it. He's no real rabbi. He'd never let this kind of woman, this sinful woman, touch him. That's going on in his heart and his mind. Got the scene? All right, let's read. I'll read from Luke chapter 7, verses 41 to 47. Jesus then tells this story in response to Simon's heart, which I think is so cool. Jesus is answering Simon's thoughts with a story. He says to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, she gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. Man, there's so much in this story. I wish we had another hour, but we don't. <laughs> that question he asks, do you see this woman? That's the most profound question you could hear this morning. Think about what's happening. Now, she's not under the table. This is Middle Eastern culture. He's reclining on a pillow at a low table. His feet are stretched out behind him. So she's at his feet behind him where everyone can see. Weeping, wetting his feet, wiping them with her hair. Everyone sees this. And Jesus is reclining on his right elbow, most likely, eating at the table. So he turns to the woman and says to Simon, which means he has to raise up and look at the woman behind him. But he's speaking to Simon, and he says, do you see this woman? What a question. Of course Simon physically sees her. He's aware she's there. But he doesn't really see her, does he? He doesn't see her at all. Not the way Jesus sees her. Not the way God sees her. 
In fact, Simon doesn't see much at all very clearly. He misjudges Jesus, the Son of God, at his dinner table, and he misses it. He misjudges his own heart, thinking I'm a pretty good guy, and he misjudges the woman. You see, when James talks about how we treat people, how you treat people, friends, is a function of how you see them. I mean, I know you can clean up your act, and you can behave in good ways toward people, but when it comes right down to it, the way you treat people has everything to do with, in your heart, how do you see them? Do you see them as objects of ridicule and disdain to be avoided? Or do you see them the way Jesus sees them? It's not just condescending to the lowly poor who are beneath me and I feel good about myself because I've done my good deed. It's not what James is talking about. He's talking about do you make distinctions and do you make judgments or do you see them with the ground is level beneath the Lord of glory? We're all the same. This is really the point of the parable that Jesus tells, isn't it? Think about this parable for a minute. Two men owe money. One owes 50, one owes five denarii. A denarii denari is a day's wage. 50 days wages, 500 days wages. It's a big difference. But neither one can pay. That's the important line. So he cancels the debt of both. Now which one will love him more? And Simon says, like he doesn't want to admit it. I suppose, he knows where this is going and he doesn't like it, right? I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. Jesus says, give the boy a cigar. He doesn't say that. He says, he says bingo, you got it, right answer. But Simon misses it. How do you see yourself is the point. Do you see yourself as a small debtor? I only need a little bit of grace. I mean, I'm not perfect. I mean, I'm not perfect, I know that, but I'm, I'm you know, on the, when I look around, I'm doing pretty well. So I need less grace than the rest of you poor people. God's getting a pretty good deal when it comes to me. Or do you see yourself as somebody who could never pay what you owe? It doesn't matter if you owe 50, 500, or 5 million, does it? If you can't pay, you can't pay. And this is the gospel. You owe a debt, you can't pay. I owe a debt, I can't pay. If that doesn't move your heart when you're singing, you're missing it. Some, if you're just thinking, man, they just sing forever around here. Right, I'll just get on with it. You're missing it. Sing your hearts out because you owe something you can't pay and it's been paid. That's why the cross is on the wall. That's why we sing about the love and grace of God. You owe something you can't pay. God loves you so much he paid it. And when you get that, you love much. Amen. You love much. Do you see what Jesus is saying? Ron gets it. <laughs> Do you see what Jesus is saying here? To the, he's saying to, this, to Simon, this woman, though her sins are many, gets it because she knows how much he's been forgiven. Simon, you see yourself as a small debtor, and therefore you can't love, and therefore you are partial to certain people, and therefore you make judgments, and you discriminate, and you're blind. The big sin at the dinner party is not the woman. It's Simon with a heart that eyes that won't weep, Knees that won't kneel, hands that won't serve, and a heart that's too proud and stubborn to love. This is the heart of what James is saying, right? What are you doing? Don't you know that who the Lord of glory is and what he's done for you? That you, are, you owe a debt you can't pay, and he paid it for you. How dare you judge other people then and discriminate against other people and make, do your little inner profiling and treat others with honor that's due only to God? It's no place in the kingdom of God. And I'm speaking to my own heart here, because when I look at those images, I mean, I picked them, but when I, got, I do my own, I got my own issues too. James is saying, you want to know what true religion looks like? It looks like how you treat people. And how you treat people has to do with how you see people. And how you see people has to do with how you see Jesus. Do you get it? How, if you see Jesus as the one who paid your debt, it changes the way you view people. It changes it. You might disagree with them. You might think they have a wrong view politically or economically or whatever, but you love them because God loves them the way he loves you. That's supposed to be the church. And too many of us, myself included, we get isolated and we think we're the good ones. They're the bad ones. <laughs> no. We all owe a debt we can't pay. We all owe a debt we can't pay. I don't know where I am. <laughs> oh, yeah, here we go. Last, the triumph of mercy. The point is this, to the degree that you have received mercy, 
you will be able to show mercy. This is the last part. I'll just read verses 12 and 13 real briefly here in James, and we'll close. He says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. That's his phrase for the gospel. Pay, a debt you can't pay has been paid for you. That's the law of liberty. Act like those who get that, he says. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. This is the same thing Jesus said to Simon, right? He who d loves, has been, been forgiven little loves little. But there are no small debtors in God's kingdom. No such thing. There's only those who think they are. And then last, Mercy triumphs over judgment. I love that last line, don't you? He's saying to you and to me, mercy triumphs over judgment. It, it's happened in your own heart. If you're in Christ, mercy has triumphed over judgment. So let that be true in the way you view other people. Let mercy triumph over the judgment in your heart for others. Let mercy triumph over the judgment in the way you see people and treat people and love people. The neighbor next door, the person at the checkout line, the immigrants being separated from their families. I mean, I know there's lots of opinions about this stuff, and I'm not talking about policy. I'm just talking about love as God's people, how we view people. There's no place for it in the kingdom of God. Why? Because we all owe a debt we can't pay, and it's been paid for us by the one who loves us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this incredible truth which boggles our mind and we fall short of, that we are the large debtors, all of us. There are no small debtors, and forgive us for thinking that we are. Help us to see people the way you see them, to love them the way you love them, the way you have loved us. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen.